Welcome everyone, good morning. My name, as Joanne said, is uh, Neil Livingstone. I'm from CFO Advisory. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. So today, we'll be talking about raising money. Um, and there's really two ways to raise money. One is capital, one is equity. I'm going to spend uh, the first half of the talk talking about uh, raising capital. And then I'm going to hand over to Abhishek. Um, so a little bit about um, who CFO Advisory is. We are a team of um, finance professionals. Uh, we've all had a number of CFO roles, more than 20 years experience. Here are some of the companies that we've uh, worked for over the last two years. Our customers usually are uh, companies that are aspirational, they want to grow, and that means they usually need money. Um, and one of, the, one of the things I enjoy most is uh, helping companies raise money, be it debt or equity. Um, a couple of quick stats about what we've been able to do for our clients over the last few years. We've successfully raised about $15 million. Uh, we've got about deals on the table right now that we're working on is at number 22. Uh, mostly with Abishak's help, um, we've, we've raised about $7 million of debt. And we also help uh, businesses sell franchises. Um, quickly running through these companies, because I'll come back to them uh, and highlight a few examples. MJ Bale, um, 40 stores, men menswear business across Australia, most people have heard of them now. Uh, Thrive is a um, fast food, a casual dining, a health uh, food chain, has six stores. Uh, Super Cheap Storage is the largest self-storage company in Australia. Um, Screen Corp, if you've ever been to a game of footy and you see those strips of LED lighting with ads running along the side, that's what they do. Um, SAC Media is listed in New Zealand and works with global brands to um, uh, place ad adverts on mobile apps. And last but not least is Live and uh, Travel. They're a piece of software that sits between the you know, what ifs and the expedias of the world and the end um, tour operator. Uh, and we've, we've raised both debt and equity in, in all six of these companies over the last few years. Um, before I go on, um, I'm going to run through the process about how we actually raise capital. Um, it's a very simple process, but it's uh, a quite surprising continually how, how, how often people don't follow the process and that's where they, they come unstuck. When we follow the process that I'm going to run through, um, we have been able to um, raise money off uh, people 90, over 90% 90 of the time. So well, we uh, go through a process and prepare uh, a presentation and we give that presentation to an investor 90% of the time and these customers, we, we raise money. So it, it works. Um, the other thing I'd add here is that most of the money that we've helped these businesses raise uh, is from private high net worth individuals. Um, there's also some strategic um, trade trade investors that we've uh, helped bring on board the, some of these businesses. And to a much lesser extent, uh, we've also raised money from hedge funds. Um, in Australia, I think, if you are a relatively small business, most of your money that you're going to most most of the time you'll be looking to uh, get money off high net worth uh, individuals in Australia. Okay. Uh, just start with a couple of home truths. Most people hopefully already know these, but um, it's really important. Raising money is not easy. Um, it's a competitive landscape, um, and uh, as I said, most of the time you're sitting in front of a high net worth individual. They are usually self-made wealthy people and they have a good understanding of the industry. So, for example, uh, we're raising money for the retail sector. You'll normally be sitting in front of people that have made their money from the retail sector. So, uh, these people are well connected. They're continually seeing uh, concepts. So, there's a very high bar. But if you can get over that bar, they will invest. Um, so when I work with a client, I always say, uh, you need to bring your best game. You've only got one shot. Treat it like a job interview um, and follow the process. Um, so here are the, 
here are the four key success factors that you're wanting uh, an investor to tick the box for each four as you walk through the presentation with them. Um, and I put it in a very, this is, this is the order that you need to actually present. So, um, and the reason is that, as I said, they're self-made uh, millionaires that you're pitching to most of the time, and they've done it themselves, and they know that to be successful it's 90% execution, 10% you know, concept or business plan. Um, a lot of people have a false misconception that the second point here, the concept and the business plan, is the most important. It is very important, but it is nowhere near as important as um, the management team. <coughs> Um, why is that? Again, like I said, the, the people that are going to be investing have built successful businesses and they know that without the right team, and particularly the, the right CEO or the right founder, um, it doesn't matter how good the idea is, it's, it's not going to be successful or it's not going to be successful to the degree that is going to make them invest. Um, so a couple of points on the management team. Again, um, people in Australia sometimes uh, don't get this one right. Um, I find that um, American business people understand uh, the concept of a management team much better than we do. They surround themselves with advisors um, and it's very normal that when they walk into a room there'll be quite a few people on their side of the table or there'll be quite a few people that they mention uh, that are going to be part of the management team. And while the founder or the, the CEO is always going to be you know, the main person, um, Again, the investors know that it's a hard road and if you don't have good people around you, it's going to be a lot harder. So if you don't bring those people you know, either on paper or in, in the room to, to, the, to the presentation, that sort of you know, is a mark against you. So typically what you're looking for is the CEO, uh, one or two uh, industry experts, and I'll just keep using retail as an example. So other people that have been successful uh, in the retail sector are going to be part of the board. They can be independent, non-executives, but they're there, they're around the table. Um, you've got a CFO, uh, such as myself, uh, either on a full-time basis or a part-time basis. Most of our clients by work part-time. Um, you'll have a tax person, depending on how important tax is to your business. Um, you'll have a lawyer. Uh, and you'll have uh, other people that I call door openers. Um, people that are great at networking and, and, and bringing strategic people to the plan. Um, so that's the first hurdle, but if you can convince them, and, and you've only got about five to ten minutes to do that in a presentation or when you first meet an investor, and if you can't get them over the line that you are um, a good team and you, you've got track record or you've got experience, it goes no further. Um, and that, that goes to the next point. Um, once they, once they are impressed with the team and they, they can see that there is, ex, you know, they've got track record and actually adding value, they, go, they, they start focusing on the concept. And um, I find time and again, I get surprised by how financially numerate high net worth investors are and they want to go straight to the numbers. Because um, they, the, they know the market quite well and they want to see the product and what that means uh, in terms of the numbers and the key assumptions. And what we do is we work um, very closely for usually a period up to a couple of months uh, and we build a five-year financial model. Um, and and that, that's an iterative process. Uh, it's a learning process for everyone involved. Sometimes the model and the assumptions that we end up with are quite different to what they were when we start. Um, and we keep going until everyone around the table is confident that that plan and that model is bulletproof. Um, and it's better to have, take a little bit longer and work out all the problems um, internally um, and, and uh, as opposed to getting asked the question and not knowing the answer and you're done with that investor. Um, so you should, and, the, and the skill is to then uh, bring that model to two slides. One is, here's the five year model, the, the, the P&L, how much money you're going to make and the second side are the key assumptions and the key drivers and, and present that very succinctly and quickly um, and, and give confidence um, that, that, that you know what you're talking about and it's a realistic forecast. Assuming that you get that box ticked, the next one is, well, I'm pretty interested now. 
um, how much do I have to pay, and what can I reasonably expect to, you know, get back? Um, a lot of people uh, don't actually cover this, and they lose investors at this point. Um, you need to tell them how much money they're going to make, or you give them a range. Um, and, the, and the rule of thumb is, uh, a high net worth investor will not invest unless they have or believe with confidence that they get a 500% return, i.e. five times their money back, over three to five years. That's, if your model is not showing that, there are going to be other people that come with these guys and give them a better, a better option. Um, and finally, if they say, yep, great team, they can execute, love the concept, love the return, what are the key risks? What am I missing here? You know, what, what's the catch? Um, and again, a lot of people um, don't cover this at all, or if they do, it's covered in a very ad hoc way. Um, and this is the last hurdle. This is the, the last objection. This is where all the last objections come out, so you've really got to nail it. And you've got to talk to it very clearly and say, here are the top three, no more than five risks, uh, preferably three, that um, we need to, we're going to have to manage as part of building this business or growing the business. And here's, here they are and here's what we're going to do. And, and that really is about a confidence building exercise to, make, to, to prove that the reason that they tick the first three boxes is valid. And all this happens in about 20 minutes. Um, if after that stage they're interested, the conversation could go a lot longer, but it will go nowhere unless they've ticked those four boxes in 20 minutes, as a rule. Okay. So here's the process. It's, there's no secret to it. I'll just run through it very quickly. Um, get very laser sharp on what you're actually trying to achieve. It's surprising how many people, when they sit down, cannot communicate in a very short period of time, very clearly, what they're trying to do. Um, if you get that wrong, you're gone in the first minute. Um, the next one would be you build a model. I've already talked to that. Um, it does take time, but you need to make sure that in your own mind when you go to sleep at night, you really believe that the work you've done and the prep you've done is uh, the makings of a solid business and it shows when you talk to other people around it. If you haven't done this, it also shows. Um, this is an obvious one. You can't, if you, if you get someone ready to invest and they get to the due diligence stage and your historical financials are a mess, or there's issues with them, they're out of there. That, that, that they know from experience, because they've, they've, they've got this experience and they've learned it the hard way, that if there are problems with your books, it's a deeper problem. Um, and they, they'll just walk away. Um, I've talked already a little bit about building the team to uh, execute the plan. It's all about the execution and having the right people and a broad skill set in the team. And I, I find that um, when I work with clients, sometimes they don't get that and they wonder why no one's giving them money. Um, and then lastly, and this is a really important one. Um, you need an investor. Ideally, brings more than just money. Um, if I go, if I go back to MJ Bayer, one of the six clients I put up on the board, one of the things they did really, really, really well is that they targeted uh, what investors to bring on. So the first big investor we brought on was the um, chairman of Orison, and. Um, you know that that brings it with it some you know kudos, um, and then in turn that attracted um, the founder of Mimco. Then we brought on uh, the guy that built up SAS and Bide, and we we just ended up with a, a shareholder base that was you know the who's who of retail. And once you get one of those people on board, it will make it much easier to bring other people on board. So who you actually go to and try and raise money from is in some ways half, sometimes half the battle. Um, any questions on so far? So a quick one, just in terms of the team, 
If you're just starting out, so we're a very new, there's only a couple of us in the business. Yep. Can you compensate for, I guess, the lack of depth of experience, um, particularly in starting at, uh, or having been through the process before by putting together yep. order advisors? Absolutely. Um, give you a few stories. Um, this morning I was with one of the clients on the screen that I put up there. Um, they are a startup. Uh, we're in the final stages of raising um, four million dollars from a uh, two, so two million each to two investors. Um, founders are very well known. Everyone will know the companies that they founded in Australia. Um, the company generates no money, and the valuation is eight million dollars. And it's because we've gone through this process. The the team. There's, there's four shareholders, I think in your situation there's two of them. Uh, but two is better than one. They've got, they've got four. They've surrounded themselves with people that have all done it before. And they've all done it before in uh, employment roles. Okay, so yes, you, you can get around that. And, but you've got to demonstrate that you've thought, thought it through. And, and here's my response. So just a few, this is the last slide, um, a few things, some of them I've already covered, but again, less is more when you're in front of someone that's a self-made successful person, they don't want their time wasted, they want you to be very clear, very concise, demonstrate that you can do um, do what you want to do. And if you don't do that, like I've, I've seen people come to me with a business plan that's 100 pages, 100 pages, I never read it. I just went, what do I need to know? You know, like if I, um, so le less is more. Um, clarity builds confidence. Um, body language. Again, uh, if I go back to the meeting this morning, it's very important when you're asking someone for money that you look at them in the eye, um, that you have very confident body language. And I've seen many people, you know, many founders, I've been in the room uh, trying to raise money with, <coughs> blow it because their body language isn't confident. The investor is going, he doesn't truly believe, he, he might just be nervous, but they're reading it as he doesn't truly believe in what he's doing. He just won't invest. Um, I'm not saying stare at them and freak them out, but uh, I'm saying you've really got to look them in the eye in those critical moments and, and don't flinch. Um, you've got to make the session when you're with these people um, interactive. It's not like us and them. You've got to break that barrier really quickly. You've got to get them asking questions. You've got to ask them questions and make it like a partnership because what that does is it gives them the idea that this is how it's going to work once I've invested as well. And that's what they want. Um, this one, if, if this is probably the most important point on the page for me, and it's something that almost nobody does when they're raising money, is demonstrate that they put their own skin in the game. A lot of founders think, well, I've spent months and a lot of my time, and but I'm not putting any money in. And maybe they don't have, have any money to put in. Um, but I always say, um, build a team around you that's going to put, even if they're putting 10 grand in, or 50 grand, or, or you're doing that, they're putting it in and they're putting it in at the valuation that you're asking other people to put in at. And if you do that, um, and if you can do that, sometimes it's just not possible, you set yourself apart instantly from 95% of everyone else trying to raise money. Um, uh, show them, oh uh, yeah, this is another good example. So um, when you already have an investor, uh, it's much easier to get money out of people you've already got money out of. Um, and one of the strategies that we always adopt is, again, put skin in the game. So every round, the CFO, if it's me, and the CEO, will put money in. It can be a nominal amount, but we're putting our hard-earned in. Um, and we also show them, we, rec we recommend an amount that they put in, and we show them what that will do to their ownership. So if you put $50,000 in, sir, um, your ownership will go from 5% to 10%. And by the way, we're participating and this is what will happen to, to, to ours. And last week we did exactly that from one of the 
clients on the on the that I showed earlier, we raised eight hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars in twenty-four hours. Um, business is tracking well, of course, always helps. Um, but you know, a couple of them came back and said, "Can I put more in? I want my ownership to be twelve percent, not eight percent." We said, "Fine, no problem." Um, build a network. Uh, I think we've kind of covered that one already. You've got to identify who the strategic investors are in, in your sector because they're the, they're the most likely to invest. They, they're the most likely to believe, get it, back you as a management team. Um, and then ask for feedback. Almost nobody does this. But you know, people, when you ask the right way, will actually tell you, this is why I invested and this is why I didn't invest. And you need to know both answers and continually work on Communication. Uh, my name is uh, Abhishek. Uh, I'm the general manager of Winco SME Finance. Uh, so we work closely with Neil and other small businesses uh, on the debt side of uh, the equation. Um, so dealing with the funders, the banks, and um, basically summing up all the options and and putting a uh, a recommendation to our, our small to medium sized businesses that we work with. Um, just a bit of an overview of what we will talk about today. Um, uh, just, just simply what the uh, options are as a business owner with, with all the funders that are out there today. Um, how as an SME or, or, or a, a, a small to medium sized business um, uh, is the best to prepare for finance uh, before approaching the lender? And um, I, I guess one of the most key uh, and important parts is what to expect from your relationship manager or your finance manager that's looking after your, uh, your situation. So in the last 12 months, just a little bit about our business. Um, as I said, I'm the, I'm the general manager of the organisation uh, and we've consulted approximately about $60 million worth of funding uh, for small businesses. Um, we work hand in hand with um, people like Neil, uh, who are the CFOs or, or who are consultants to the business. Uh, as you can see, we work closely with Thrive. And we're, so if anyone's down that area and is a bit hungry, um, certainly uh, certainly go down to that, uh, to that store there very soon. Um, so yeah, I'll just r run straight into um, what uh, what the type of products there are out there for, for small to medium sized businesses. Um, the, one of the uh, one of the products that uh, a lot of uh, businesses are unaware of is is a simple un unsecured overdraft um, from someone like A and Z. Uh, I recently had a client where we just we, they just started in business. Uh, it was about uh, three months. We opened up their transactional banking with ANZ and within about three months time they were able to get, uh, I think it's about $50,000 worth of unsecured funding, no security against any property um, and the best part was they didn't have to declare any financial information, just a, just a director's guarantee and, um, a, and um, you know, a credit check against their name. Um, this is very uh, beneficial um, because it, it sets your first uh, stage up of you know, if, if the bank's willing to invest in you and if you are looking at further investors in the business, um, when, the, when the bank puts their own skin in the game, or oh, when you put your skin in the game, the bank puts their skin in the game, it shows that it's not just yourself uh, being involved in that transaction, there are investors out there as well. But there are other parties or a third party to your business who's, uh, who's looking to invest in your business. Uh, and um, an unsecured overdraft is very um, uh, important in that process because there's no other security involved. Um, there's a, there, that's, a, that's a range of the pricing down there, which is 12 to 16 percent per annum. But that's on the on the amount um, that you uh, that you use. So if you don't use the overdraft, obviously uh, pricing is, is is cheaper. And the, the key part in that is, uh, uh, and one of my recommendations are, is is looking at banking with ANZ just for your business banking, and looking at the the deposits that go in because they assess their serviceability. On um, on the transactional banking, which is which is very important. So we now look at uh, commercial finance, uh, which is pretty much all the majors I look to consider, and that's if there is some security, uh, s some uh, some security uh, involved in there. So if there's some um, if there's some property, commercial or residential, um, the biggest benefit here is that. Um, let's just say you have a property that's worth around a uh, million dollars, and you're looking at funding. Well, in and above that, um, let's just say people for about one and a half to two mil worth of funding. Um, the bank sees 
that yes, the property is only worth a million dollars, but if you have a strong trading history, if you have a strong business and you have a strong business plan, um, that they'll look to lend well and above what that security is worth. Um, so as, as Neil was saying, that, that's another test of skin in the game is, is putting a property up um, if you're looking for those higher levels of funding. Obviously you can see that the price is a, is a lot cheaper when there's a, a little bit of uh, property involved as well. Um, equipment finance, um, there's a list of lenders there that certainly certainly will help. Um, probably the biggest uh, thing at the market where a lot of uh, uh, business are taking advantage of is if, if you don't have uh, your financials in order or if, uh, you know you just want to get something done fairly quickly, if you've been two years in business and a property backed and have don't don't have any sort of um, credit issues against your name, uh, getting uh, uh, finance up to 150,000. And if we use multiple banks, you can get up to about 300,000 in equipment finance or vehicle financing um, uh, without any questions asked besides um, you know, that, that credit check. Uh, next we're looking at rental finance. Um, this is where uh, you know a lot more eligible for businesses that are, are in the uh, in the startup phase, most suitable for um, IT and, and 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 software funding. So we can actually fund a software program as well if it's from a reputable supplier. Um, and, and there's a couple of uh, uh, lenders there that that, that that can certainly help. Um, the other policy is if, if you're not a startup, if you're two, if you're five years in business and don't own any property. You can get about, uh, I think it's about forty thousand dollars without showing any financial information as well. Sorry, five uh, minutes. Yeah, five minutes. Okay, shouldn't take too long. Um, the next couple, the, the next product that's fairly important, which you can uh, fund against your outstanding invoices, is invoice discounting. Um, there's separated in two tiers. The, the the major banks that are generally uh, looking at this are uh, Westpac and National Australia Bank, uh, and the pricing is very is very uh, reasonable when you when you're looking at uh, you know a strong business that's been in business for a while. Um, if you're you, you fall into the second tier when um, when there's uh, situations of tax debt or any other types of issues that the business might have, or even startups, we can we can certainly look at other funders. Um, I believe there's a couple of the co uh, um, some of the lenders that do fund these type of invoices uh, actually presenting today, such as FIFO Capital, uh, which uh, Lockwood will tell you a little bit more about. Uh, after our session. There's an interesting new type of finance that's also come out called Merchant Cash Advances. Um, it's a, mainly a, a fairly popular type of financing structure in, um, in America. Uh, it's just entering the market and uh, you know, it's on the basis of uh, your, your takings. It works well for a retail type of business or someone in the, in the, um, in the, in the food industry um, where they can take, um, where the turnover is high and we can lend against the actual um, monthly takings, uh, roughly at about, uh, I think it's about 80% of the, the, monthly, t uh, the monthly takings. Uh, as we all know, home loan finance, um, given property prices in, in, uh, in, in, Australia, oh, in Sydney at the moment, um, it's a great way to tap into some equity, um, even if you're starting out as well. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of company, uh, there's a couple of banks out there that you know, won't use um, your, um, like if, you, if, you're, if, you're work, if you're currently um, PAYG employee and you're looking to go into self-employment, they can look to advance you um, uh, up to 80% against your property at a very reasonable rate as well. Um, the, the main banks that we're dealing with at the moment are Macquarie Bank and Fastlane, where, where Macquarie, Land, uh, Macquarie Bank um, uh, won't ask any questions on what you're gonna use the money for as long as you've got the, um, the equity in that property. Uh, and can justify serviceability, and we can certainly get you a rate of uh, under 5%. Also, there's a lot of franchising around at the moment, so we can certainly look at franchise funding. It's usually up to about 70% of that purchase price, which is technically unsecured, uh, but um, yeah, secured against the business as such, but there's no need for any property depending on the type of franchise that's involved. Look, uh, probably, Four of the um, uh, key things to, to worry about when you're, uh, or to be concerned about when, when you're applying for finance is, is the preparation of it. And, and having a clear credit history is, is probably one of the major things. Uh, that shows your conduct and how you, um, how you are um, with other finance that's, that's been given and gives the lender that, that trust to, to, um, uh, to, to provide you 
uh, that financing, knowing that you'll be paying it back and there's no issues going forward as well. Um, having the information ready is, is key. So I think a lot of well, a mistake that a lot of small businesses do is go go to the bank manager and. Uh, you know, have half the financials ready, or don't have some of the information ready. But a lot of the a lot of the bankers want everything at once, and I guess engaging a broker or a finance part, partner like um, someone like our business or some other businesses out there as well it is handy because they can get you best prepared for it and put all the information together. Um, and I think the key thing there is approaching the right funders at the right time. So I've given you a little bit of a, a snapshot of um, how well. What, what fund and what type of finance you can look to get uh, on different lifestyles of, on different um, life cycles of your business. So if you're a startup, a certain type of finance is much more appropriate than if you're a mature business that's seeking, you know, a, a, a massive amount of, of loans. So it's just about approaching the lender at the right time. Uh, as, as discussed, um, you know. Serviceability and security is, 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 is very important as well. Um, but I guess a good, a good business case is, 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 is important as well. So if you've got your business in line, if you've got uh, you know, good clients, if you've got a good business plan, that, that's what um, investors, or that's what uh, bankers really look at. And if you can show where there's a second way out or if there's a, if there's a fallback position, um, that, that's also very key. The key thing to look at when you're searching for a relationship manager doesn't doesn't matter if it's in uh, if it's a banker directly, if it's a broker like myself or or, or a second tier funder, is that person needs to understand your business. Um, I think the lender is only as good as that relationship manager that you're talking to and you're speaking with. Um, you know, it's also dependent on what type of lot, um, you know, what stage they're in in their banking career or in their finance career. Because if there's someone that's hungry to to write business, or if there's a bank that's hungry to write business, they will do a lot more uh, to try and um, uh, get some some finance approved. Um, but if there's, you know, you know, if, if there's someone that's busy and doesn't get back to your calls. And, and, and does not really, you know, um, you know, manage you properly. Uh, you just know that the experience is going to be bad, and e even though the product might be cheap, it's going to cause you more. It's going to be harder than what it is. So, a relationship manager, in my point of view, is the most important part when seeking finance because they will guide you around the process, and they will, and they will, a good relationship manager won't waste your time, and that's but that's probably the most important thing um, uh, that uh, uh, that business owners in Australia need is more time. So you don't want anyone wasting your time or or um, or uh, you know uh, just just uh, just just leading you in the wrong direction. Uh, 